As you can see, the, these GBT tools that are being released today are really quite amazing. And they're going to make a huge difference in the, the world of global health. This is going to help us uh, tell that story and get better health policies uh, more rapidly than we've been able to do in the past. No two places in the world are alike. Neither are the people, the customs, and landscape. Every country has to examine the hand they're dealt and use that to decide the best course of action for its citizens. After all, if you're a desert nation with high oil reserves, you probably focus on exporting the product instead of investing in promoting tourism. Our next guest says health care should be treated the same way by breaking down the data, noticing the differences in populations, and determining the best course of action for a country's particular set of citizens. Our guest is the author of the book Epic Measures, One Doctor, Seven Billion Patients. Welcome Jeremy Smith to Midpoint. Jeremy, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. Jeremy, there's so much data here that literally you can get lost in it. Kind of boil it down for us a little bit into what makes the book, what specific data that you're pointing at that tells us how we need to run our health care. Well, the project I profile in the book is like Google Earth for health. So you can survey an entire continent like Africa, see what's killing people and making them sick, or you can zoom all the way down to your country, like the United States in our case, or even where you have more data, your county, and you can see how you compare to other counties next to you, how your country compares to other countries in the same economic bracket, and you can see what you're doing right and where you've got some serious problems and you could really improve. Okay, now let's first deal with the consumer. If the consumer gets a chance to look at all this, how do they then use it? Because let's face it, when you go from county to county, state to state, sometimes you won't know, oh, well, this I do different, this I do different. There's a lot of information to take in for the common man. Yeah, so for me, when I looked up for my health and my family, I looked at the risk factors first. And the risk factors are what kind of behaviors or conditions lead to premature death and disability. So there are things like smoking, diet, malnutrition, exercise, workplace injury. And I wanted to see what were the biggest problems, for example, for a 35 to 39 year old male in the United States. And I was surprised that the biggest cause of death in my age group isn't violence, uh, it isn't car crashes, it isn't something like heart attack or cancer. It's actually suicide. So self-harm is sort of the biggest killer in my age group. But for the risk factors, it's diet related. In the United States, our biggest sort of bang for our buck in diet, according to this science, is eating a little bit more fruit. Fruit consumption wards off heart disease and stroke, and those are our two biggest killers. Is it fair to say that all of this information, and I've just had a chance just to scan over it a little bit, but what you're talking about, what I've seen, doesn't this break down to common sense in so many ways if you look at it? Because even what you just said right here, if you want to stay healthier in America, you've got to worry about smoking and fats and eating. All you have to do is eat fruit. It just seems like stuff we've heard millions of times before. Well, what this does is it puts hard numbers. You can see exactly how important one kind of behavior or cause is compared to another. So, for example, what's more important, quitting smoking or eating more fruit? Uh, getting more exercise or making sure you've got clean air and water in your environment. And this can say, for example, look at global health. Uh, for years, we've had many people and many celebrities pushing the cause of clean water and sanitation. And those are important causes. But it turns out that the problem of dirty air inside homes from unclean cook stoves is actually 10 times worse for people in developing countries. So that's the kind of thing where you can say, gosh, we're putting 90% of our resources into something that may only be 10% of our problem. And meanwhile, half of our problems we might not be addressing at all. One line that you had here in the book that I got right away, money is not going where it is needed the most. We consistently, matter of fact, just yesterday on the show, we talked about the price of cancer drugs being so expensive that most people can't afford them. Again, it comes down to money. But what you're telling us is, especially in developing countries, the money's there in some cases, but it's just not being spent properly. There's so many ways to invest better. I, you know, I'd love there to be even more money for global health. At the same time, you can get a huge bang for your buck uh, with the same amount of money that if you redirect it to the causes that are actually killing people. For example, the same kind of lifestyle diseases that kill people in our country, cancer, diabetes, heart disease, those are responsible for two thirds of deaths in poor countries as well but they only get about 1% of health funding. So think of that mismatch, 64% of deaths, 1% of health funding. 
Mexico, a country which we normally don't think of here in America. We don't think of them as being far ahead of the curve when it comes out to health. Let's be very honest here. But Mexico used this service to tailor their health insurance with a blanket coverage of 16 million people. Now, wait a minute. Mexico actually used this. Why aren't we using something like this to set policy? Well, in the United States, we are proud to have a fragmented health system. We have health systems that vary on a public basis by state and on a private basis from individual to individual. That's very powerful. We rank very well in responsiveness to patient demand. So our systems meet the demand of people who are able to come in and pay for them. But there's many people outside the ability to pay for them. And then there's prevention. And there's really no money and no comprehensive blanket being put into preventing these causes. We want to catch people before they go to the doctor if possible. So here we are talking about health care in America, the Affordable Health Care Act. And everybody believes that this was set up to specifically take care of a lot of issues here, help us be healthier. Did they use this material? I get the sense right away that a lot of the material that's here, they didn't use it in creating Obamacare. Well, you know, there's covering people and then there's what you actually choose to cover. You know, the secret of public health insurance, national health insurance, blanket coverage is it's not magic. You still have a limited amount of money and you have to choose what you're spending it on. And so what we're going to have to do in every country, private, public, whatever your system is, is you have to make hard choices at some point and say, are we putting our money into the solutions that are actually our greatest problems? And if we're not, can we get a much bigger return if we invest more wisely? When we talk about the fact that America's not getting it done, I also point out Australia used this service. They went from joint 20th life expectancy tied with the U.S. to number three in the world. Are we just stubborn and arrogant and egotistical here in America not to want to use this material to help us? Uh, you know, I think that we have the ability to move quickly when we get new information. And I hope that that will be something we're able to do. Australia is a country of 22 million people. They've got a hundred billion dollar public health system with essentially a few people at the top who are able to make decisions pretty rapidly. The U.S. has a lot more people, a lot more complex problems, but we too can make pretty rapid gains. There are counties in the U.S. that in the last generation have had a lifespan improvement of about 10 years. There are other counties where people have actually fallen back for the first time in recorded history in this country without there being an accompanying war or epidemic. Do we know where America is right now on these numbers? Uh, they used to be 20th. Are we any better now? I'm afraid that we are fallen since that last ranking and we're now about 40th on most rankings like child mortality, life expectancy, adult mortality uh, and that's pretty much the bottom among other wealthy western countries. So there's a lot to be said by studying what people in other countries are doing well and also studying where we're doing well. If every county in the U.S. had the same life expectancy gains of places like New York City over the last generation we'd be the longest living country in the world. So what's happening in New York that's not happening elsewhere? We need to look into that. By the way, I want to remind everybody, it is healthdata.org's Global Burden of Disease interactive map, if you wanted to check that out. Also want to remind everybody, the book is called Epic Measures, One Doctor, Seven Billion Patients. And Jeremy, I thank you. And while you didn't say it, I'll go ahead and say it. It just seems like maybe we're a little bit stubborn and arrogant. And we need to kind of get off the dime a little bit and help on this. Jeremy, thanks so much. Good luck with the book. Thank you so much. All right, take care. Now, here's to you. Should these statistics be used to adjust the United States health policy? And why do you think? Maybe why aren't we using it? Go to Newsmax.com slash comments. Give us your thoughts. We'll talk about it here. Hey, let's face it. No matter how you slice it, it's still in our hands to live a better life one way or another. Coming up next, the city in Florida that has decided it's time to become a gay marriage destination on Midpoint.